Hello everybody and welcome to the 6th episode on the PTNW Podcast. I'm your co-host, Dariq Kareem. I'm your other co-host, Jeremiah Alondra. And today we're joined by your guest for this episode, Ephraim Jacob. Welcome to the show, Ephraim. Uh, thank you, Arik. It's a pleasure. So, our question of the day today is a little bit about school. And seeing that school, rather online school, is going to be happening in less than four weeks, here's a question that relates to the academics. What's your favorite academic subject in school? My favorite academic subject would probably be history by a long shot. Usually other kids would be so invested in sports, going to all these competitions, but I'd rather just stay home, read a good book about history, as there's so much you could learn from it. Most of the stuff that is happening today could correlate to what happened in the past. And you could see a lot of similarities uh, between these two things, which could help you predict what could happen in the future. And once you learn all these small things, you could, in the past, you could see how different things um, are correlated. And it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. History is very lengthy. So what part of history are you most fascinated with? I am really interested in the... Uh, Nopleonic Wars in the 20th century, World War One, World War II. It's, it's mind-boggling what happened. And actually, today, when we're recording, this August 6th, on Thursday, 1945, the United States dropped the world's first nuclear bomb on Hiroshima in Japan from the Enola Gay bomber, which was uh, made by Chrysler. The atomic bomb... Uh, the, its power equaled 12,500 tons of TNT and leveled one-third of the buildings in Hiroshima. The catastrophic attack actually left 80,000 dead initially. However, in the months that followed, um, approximately 60,000 more died from related injuries and illnesses. Actually, which is uh, kind of ironic, all but 20 of the city's 200 doctors were either killed or in keep incapacitated by the attack, resulting in a devastating shortage of medical care that contributed to the high death toll in the months that followed. Wow. And it really taught us about, you know, the dangers of atomic bombs. It was really the first time in history where uh, such weapons of mass destruction were employed. So, Yes, that is true. And sadly, we're seeing things like this today. Just recently in uh, Lebanon, there was an explosion. Catastrophic. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, uh, Ephraim, when was the first time that you really got interested in history? When, was, when did it all start? I'd say hmm, starting kindergarten when everyone was like first choosing books to read actual books, I got invested in a smaller line of history books. Obviously not long, 300-page novels, but they were, it, I found them really interesting knowing that this something so different from today actually happened, but just in the past, a long time ago, that actually something this important happened before I even existed. So I really got into that, and by the time I was in like fifth, fourth grade, I was really invested in history and studying it in my free time. Mm -hmm. While well, the other kids were just doing sports and and whatnot, having not in the world. Um, Ephraim, if you if you wouldn't mind, uh, I, I prepared something uh, before this, and uh, I'd like you to show to demonstrate yeah, your um, historical skill. So uh, I've prepared something here. Um, can you tell me one f very uh, one fact? about Rudolf Hess. Rudolf Hess, very interesting uh, character. He was the deputy in chief to Hitler, number two, and his regime proud so loved Hitler, basically worshipped him. Kind of weird, because we have the same eyebrows. Um, so, the Scottish escaped. It is an event of mass speculation People question it. Very interesting. 
So this Rudolf Hess, he knew Germany could not win against the British. But by the time people started realizing that uh, in a mass, it was in like 1944, late 1944, 1945. But this was in 1941. Saying something that Germany could lose the war, done, Gestapo arrests you. So Rudolf Hess really does not want to continue the war with Great Britain. So he steals a plane, a Messerschmitt, and flies and uh, attempts to go to Great Britain. He really wants to meet Winston Churchill and try and make a peace accord with him. But the thing is, Hitler, Joseph Goebbels, Hermann Goring, they did not know about this. The last thing they wanted was a peace uh, treaty or a um, uh, ceasefire with the British. They wanted to continue on. But his plane, Rudolf Hess, as he's flying, crashes in Scotland, and a farmer finds him. And so the British come, they take him. He requests to see Winston Churchill, but they say, the British say, okay, we'll take you to Winston Churchill, but they lock him up. Until after the trial in 19, when the war ends in 1945, he's finally take, taken to trial in 1946 during the Nuremberg trials, where he sees Hermann Goring and many other high ranking um, Nazi officers who committed many war crimes during World War II. So he gets sentenced to life in prison, Rudolf Hess. Yeah. When he's 93 years old, the doctor says he can't lift his arms above his head. He's very weak. He's still kept in a prison. He's the only prisoner there, and, they, and they're running this whole prison for him. It's said that Rudolf Hess knows a lot of information about other countries and all that, and has a lot of, let's say, dirt on other countries. He's out for a stroll in the garden in the prison. He's the only prisoner there. No security guards were on watch. And he was found hanged. Apparently a suicide. Oh. Well, how indeed. Yeah, that's very interesting. The history is quite fascinating. It's very in-depth. And I think it's quite commendable that you know all of this information. Uh, yeah. I can actually, man. That, that's really amazing, yeah. So, on the topic of history, based on the response that you just gave, um, you must have like not a lot of knowledge on World War One and World War Two. So, explain an event in your opinion um, that was interesting to you. You know that could have happened in either World War One or World War Two. You know something that your attention, something that was perhaps obscure to you. Hmm. That is something I'd really like to talk about. Since you mentioned, uh, I already talked about a bit about World War II, let's do World War I now. Mm -hmm. So, Ooh, Black Hand. there was a terrorist organization named the Black Hand. So, and back then, Austria-Hungary was Austria-Hungary. It was the Austria-Hungarian mm -hmm. Empire. They were together, and they were ruled by, obviously, a royal family. And so next in line, behind the king, his son, was Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Correct. He won. So Austria-Hungary owned a lot of Slavic states. They wanted to keep the country. They wanted to, they wanted to make them part of Austria-Hungary. Uh, and the... And, and that is something um, Archduke Franz Ferdinand supported, uh, keeping all the Slavic states together with Austria-Hungary. But the Black Hand, a terrorist organization that resided in Serbia, which was one of the Slavic states, they wanted the Slavic states to separate from Austria-Hungary, and they wanted those states to unite as one Slavic nation. And one 
eight, 19 year old uh, kid named uh, Gavilor, Gavilor, Gavarillo Princip, he decided to take action. So, him and a few other men, they went to a motorcade. They went to a motorcade that Archduke Franz Ferdinand was in. And so the motorcade is driving on the road. Multiple cars. Archduke Franz Ferdinand is one of them. One of his pals throws a grenade under the car. It doesn't go off for 10 seconds. It explodes under another car. And obviously Archduke Franz Ferdinand's car rushes, rushes away. And multiple people died and are injured. And that the man, he takes cyanide, the man who threw the bomb. He took uh, the capsule of cyanide, but it's expired. And when he finds out it's expired, he tries to jump off a bridge. Little does he know the bridge is two feet off the ground. So the police capture him. And so later, Gavilero, Gavarillo Princip, he's sitting at a cafe. He's like, oh, darn. I missed my shot to kill Gavrilo Princip, all because my pal's uh, grenade didn't go off. So he's there at the cafe. He ordered a sandwich. But meanwhile, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, his car is speeding away to the palace after the explosion. In that car is one of Austria-Hungary's top generals, his pregnant wife, and the driver, and Archduke Franz Ferdinand. But Archduke Franz Ferdinand says, you know what, I want to go to the hospital hospital and visit the people who got injured in the explosion so the driver says okay so they turn around they start going to the hospital but on the way to the hospital the driver makes a wrong turn and drives past the street where the cafe is where gavarillo prints up is eating so the car with the drive is uh, because of that wrong turn goes past the cafe, and Gavrilo prints up sees and says, ah, oh, the car's going too fast. Even though I have a second chance right here, it's most likely not going to work. But as it's going down the wrong street, the driver realizes it's on the wrong street. So it starts to, it stops the car, and he starts to back up slowly towards the cafe. Mm-hmm. Gavrilo prints up, takes his chance. Uh, so he goes up, looks to see if there's any guards, and another thing, it's the car actually breaks down as it's backing up right in front of the cafe. So Gavrilo takes up, takes this chance, fires three shots. One hits Gavrilo Prince up in the ab, in the chest, and one hits his uh, the pregnant wife. But most likely, people people assume that Gavrilo Prince up was not trying to shoot the wife; he was trying to actually shoot the general. But he missed, and the third bullet just goes into the. Uh, hits the car frame. And oh. so he kills Archduke Franz Ferdinand. He dies right there on the spot. And Gavrilo Princip also takes the cyanide, realizes it's expired. it's expired. He doesn't know what to do. So he's arrested. And wow. basically after that, Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia. And because Germany is has a treaty with um, Austria-Hungary, it also declares war on Serbia. And Russia. Russia sees Serbia as kind of, um, like, family, because they have the same, basically, folklore. They have the same, similar language, same culture. So Russia declares war on Germany and Austria-Hungary. And that, after that, and that, and that, and that's how World War I started. All ignited from one conflict. Wow. Yeah, that one war caused Korea, Vietnam, the Persian Gulf, World War II, World War One. Consequences, consequences were devastating. Hmm. So now I'd like to delve a little bit into how you feel about history. Uh, when you study history, when you look into these conflicts, all of these details, What's that feeling you get? How do you feel from it? I get a sense of regret because of the many bad things that happened, but also 
a sense of happiness of how it turned out that we're here having this meeting. It turned out well. Germany, they won World War II. It would have been bad. Terrible. I probably wouldn't be here as a, as a Jew. So you also have to be thankful for how it turned out. But at the same time, you also have to regret and mourn what happened in the past. It's all about learning from the mistakes of the past and that knowledge of the future. That's quite fascinating, indeed. So now turning a little bit away from history, we're going to talk about um, what activity comforts you. Uh, what do you feel is something that you can enjoy in your free time? Because we covered a little bit about pastimes in our other episodes. We actually had one with our guest, uh, Nicholas. So we just wanted to get your insight on what you find is comfortable. I know a lot of kids my age would say probably something about being on the, the Xbox or console, electronics, video games. I too would like to be like that, but unfortunately I do not own a console, so I really had to adapt. I grew very fond of Lego in my early years, and I've been collecting ever since. Star Wars, City, uh -huh. um, and also getting some custom stuff from Brickmania, Citizen Brick, and the Minifigure Co for some history Lego. It's very interesting where some hobbies can take you. So uh, about this history Lego, um, who, yeah. do you like create, recreate like battles or um, just normal historic, like create historical events uh, with Lego? Yes, that's something uh, that's happened because um, the founder of Lego, Okurt Christensen, he swore never to make any Lego military sets, because during World War II in Denmark, his um, uh, base house and, a and his factory, Lego factory, was uh, burnt and destroyed uh, two times during the war. So he swore never to make any military stuff. And because of that, that has forced me to open up and actually uh, make my own military stuff mocks my own creation and there's custom lego sites like brick mania uh citizen brick minifigure co that make really detailed uh like um uh kits and minifigures that are with real uh lego bricks not knockoffs that really that basically expand on history and yes i do create some uh, models and dioramas the figures, I really like the figures, as they could be very detailed, and they could have the same historic ranks. I have a figure of Erwin Rommel, Desert Fox, one of my favorite generals. That's neat. So you're kind of tying in your passion with understanding history with your hobby of Legos. That's, that's, yeah. that's yeah. really neat. It's really enjoyable. And the same thing with the Star Wars. I have a lot of Star Wars sets right next to the laptop um, we're recording this on. I have my Death Star sitting right next to me. Uh, Lego Death Star? Yes, Lego Death Star. How long, if you don't mind me asking, uh, how long did it take you to uh, assemble the uh, Lego Death Star? Oh, I don't mind at all. It should have taken me a day, but my mom's parents were here, so it took me three days. an impressive you know, amount of time to build it. Thank you. I'm really hoping for the UCS Manilium Falcon. Um, so, from what's the fastest time you've assembled a, a Lego set? Well, if you ask me that, I mean, it depends, because $15 Lego set takes like 5 minutes to 20 minutes. But then you get into Lego sets like the Tanty V4, the AT-AT Walker, even City Modular sets, the Modular series. Those could take up to a day, uh, multiple hours of hard work. But usually it doesn't take me more than a day. The Death Star was the only exception. Okay. Tying it in together... Um between history and Legos, do you find that there's anything similar? 
I do find some stuff sim uh, similar, as Lego is a part of history, and always will be. I mean, the way it was created, the backstory behind the creator, how he created it, meaning Oka Christensen, it's truly fascinating. And how, even now, Lego with Lego, you could rep uh, replicate uh, events from the past. For Lego, is that what you enjoy doing the most? Is that the favorite part of Lego? To recreate these scenes? Yes, I mm -hmm. Making mocks is uh, great. That's quite interesting, Ephraim. I'm going to wrap up today's podcast. Thank you so much for joining us, Ephraim, and for our listeners. Thank you so much for tuning in.